Good morning, New Hope. Welcome to uh, Bible Boot Camp 2020. <clears throat> How many, thank you all for coming out on a Saturday morning. How many have been on one or more of the New Hope trips that we've done to, is, oh wow, okay. So to you guys then, Bokar Tov. You say back, Bokar or, all right, let's try this one. Shabbat Shalom. Does that work? Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Dr. Gary. All right. Just warming up just a little bit. Thanks for coming out um, this morning in the first session. What we're going to do is orient you to the land of Israel. In the second session, we're going to be, it, we're just, it's a kind of a pick and choose sort of thing. We're going to take <clears throat> a couple of parables of Jesus uh, about fathers and then compare that to one of uh, the parables of the rabbis from the early um, years around the time of Jesus and get the point of comparison, see what Jesus is doing, see what other rabbis in the first century in the land of Israel are doing. Um, in the uh, third session, we're going to switch gears and we're going to take an example from the life of Paul. And we're going to look at how putting that into all of its 3D context with geography, with ancient history, culture, ancient literature, teachings of the rabbis and stuff, and how that plays in to Paul's conversion experience on the road to Damascus. Does that sound okay with you guys? We're not going to daisy chain them all together. We're going to take a break around 10. We're going to take a break around 11. So you can get up and you can fill your tummy and empty your bladder and whatever you need to do on break. That'll be totally your call. But um, what we'd like to do now is go to the land of Israel. I want to introduce you to this. <clears throat> 26 years ago, I had a conversation with a gentleman who lives in Cyprus. He had lived in Israel for about 30 years. He's the foremost photographer of the land of Israel alive today. He does amazing work. And for 26 years, I've been involved in this project of uh, creating things that help to remove the world of the Bible, the land of the Bible, the land of Israel, from the mythical and the make-believe and the once upon a time and a land far, far away and bring that into visible, observable, tangible reality. And that really is the essence of our faith. That which our eyes have seen, that which our hands have touched, that's what John says in the little letter of 1 John at the end of the Bible. That's what we proclaim to you. That's what the first century witnesses to the life and ministry of Jesus brought to the table. And that's still what's around today. Not Jesus in the flesh. He's ascended and glorified and seated at the right hand of the Father. But what we're seeing is the stuff that, that, that makes up the nuts and bolts and the guts of the Bible. The Bible doesn't just drop out of heaven on golden plates. If, if that's kind of your mentality and where you are, there's another church probably down the road, maybe in Urbandale, that believes that. But we have a Bible that is gritty, that has dirt under the fingernails, that's roll up your sleeves, get sweaty, get real. That's the world of, of our Bible. The good, the bad, and the ugly, yes, that's our Bible because it's hanging out all the dirty laundry and telling the truth and being real and they're failing people that make mistakes and God has to help and fix and forgive, etc., etc. That's what we're looking at. So we're trying in a certain sense to rescue the Bible from the once upon a time and they all lived happily ever after sort of bedtime story world that most people think of and help people to connect the world, the, the, the revelation of scripture with the playing board that it happened on. So what I thought we would do, what I, how I thought we would start out is the way that your next trip in uh, March of 2022 Boy, that's a long time to save up shekels, isn't it? Yeah? Okay. So, you know, all that, you know, COVID-ridden change that you're throwing down on the floorboard of your car, right? And now the Fed's saying, please bring your change in. We, we don't have enough to keep the economy going. I took a picture of one in a 
Casey's quick stop yesterday. You know, um, well, keep that change and put it toward the, the next trip. So what I thought we would do is take the first couple of days of our next trip, fly over it, and then do a bigger picture of here's the land of Israel, the world of the Bible, and give you a chance to fly there and go there digitally. Fair enough? Okay. So we start our trip in, over the Mediterranean, and we are going to fly into the airport that you will be landing at when you get to Israel. So what you see in front of you is the land of Israel, the Mediterranean. You can see the lower Jordan Valley and the Dead Sea. The area around Jerusalem right here. Tel Aviv right below you and Joppa where Peter had his vision about going to the home of Cornelius. So we fly right over Tel Aviv and you can see the airport in the background, the little triangle there. This is Ben Gurion Airport. This is where your plane's gonna land. So are your trays folded in their upright and locked position? <laughs> do, you, do you have your seat belt uh, fastened firmly? Okay. So this is the airport that we're going to land on and I don't know which of those airstrips. Either one of them's fine. It depends on wind direction. My wife and I landed there in 1982. One-way ticket. We had moved to Israel to study, do a master's degree in Hebrew and we're still connected with that land. Still have dear friends there. More now than we ever had, have had. And uh, this is sort of our... Okay, New Hope is our second home. This is like our third home away from home. Love this land. We're there all the time except with COVID. Had to be evacuated out of there this past March. And so now we land in uh, Tel Aviv at Ben Gurion Airport and we swing to the north. And we'll be staying at a modern Israeli town called Netanya. See the little white box there? And you can see the ground clutter. That's where people live and work. All right? We will be going down this road right here. And then we'll have to turn left into Netanya. Then you get to spend the night there, walk on the beach, get your feet wet in the Mediterranean get back on the bus in the morning and head, continue to go north. This is, we're facing north. Up the same highway and then we join the Old Testament road. That's the blue road. The red roads are Roman roads. Join the Old Testament road and go into this large sand dune area. The coast is the only place where Israel has real sand. Um, this is not, you know, barren desert wilderness. You see people farming all over the place, right? You know aerial ph satellite photography, yes? So we go then next to the city of Caesarea. This is the place, and I'll just stop. This is the place where Peter preached to the centurion. This is the place where Paul launches off into his three missionary journeys that take the good news to non-Jews. You and I this morning are downstream from those events. This is where Philip the evangelist ended up stopping, raising a family, sowing the seed, and plowing the ground that would prepare for the ministries of people like Peter and Paul in Caesarea later on. It's the Roman capital of the land of Israel in Jesus' day. Jerusalem is still the spiritual capital of the Jewish people, but this is the Roman capital. This is where the procurator, Pontius Pilate, Felix, Festus, and others lived. Uh, this is where the, most of the Roman legions are gathered around to protect the procurator and then be dispatched out into the hinterland if there was a problem. Okay, so some of you have been here. I saw a lot of hands. You've been to Caesarea. Amazing? Yes? yes. Beyond maybe amazing? Unbelievable. We could spend the whole time 
when we're in Israel, if it's a week and a half, two weeks, I think we're doing, we could spend the whole two weeks just in this one spot. But we have other fish to fry, so we continue on. From Caesarea, I'm going to go down so that you can see what is, what is flat and what is, uh, what, what is mountainous. Maybe down just a little bit more. Okay, so we're on the coast. But if you look just a little bit to the right, you're in the mountains of Samaria. And we'll be seeing Samaria from several different perspectives. Right now we're in the west looking east. Continuing up the coast, I'm going to speed up just a little bit. In fact, I think I'm going to click and drag. Get back up a little altitude. We're going to go to Mount Carmel. Contrary to popular opinion, it's not Mount Caramel. That would be a candy that you can get at Walmart. Carmel, it means the vineyard of God because it's so fertile here. Rain or dew or snow, 250 days out of the year. And we're going to be going to this spot right here. Stop. Muhraka. It's the place where Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. And they couldn't get rain to come or fire to fall. And Elijah got both with one simple prayer. Lord, um, let everybody know that you're the real God of Israel and that I've only done these things according to your word. And here it goes. We're going to be at that pretty much exact spot. You can see that we're in the mountains here. I'm going to click and drag back just a little bit. See all this, these drainage systems draining water off the highlands. Okay, so we're going to be right here at Muhraka, or the, the place where the fire fell, and we're going to be looking across a valley. You can see it right here. Yes? All right. This is the Jezreel Valley. In late 1800s, people began to identify that as the Valley of Armageddon. Maybe we should go up a little bit higher and get back a little bit to give you some perspective. How's that? Is that a little bit better? See where you are now? You can see the Sea of Galilee here and the Jordan Valley. Lower Jordan here and the Upper Jordan there. Okay, so we're at Muhraka right here. That's our second stop. And then we're going to go across this valley. We won't be going to this area airport that's a military airport and uh, if those of you who have been there it's really top secret two-thirds of its underground so that the bombs can't reach the airplanes they're in bunkers underneath the ground and uh, this is the guardian of the of the north so this is that valley that we were talking about the Jezreel or Armageddon valley right across it is a ridge that runs sort of southwest to northeast. It's called the Nazareth Ridge. Okay, I'm a professor, so I get to do these pop quizzes from time to time. You'll toughen up here in just a little bit. Um, the reason this is called the Nazareth Ridge is because the main city on this ridge is the city of fill in the blank. 100%. A plus. In Hebrew, Aleph plus. All right, so we're going to drag over there past the airport. You did not see that, okay, to the Nazareth Ridge. And we are at the city of Nazareth. There we will visit the Church of the Annunciation and an archaeological excavation that is first century. You'll see first century homes. And if it's not Joseph and Mary's home, okay, well, it was a neighbor's home. And a neighbor that they knew very well because Nazareth only housed about, 100, about 300 to 400 people max. So everybody knew everybody. In fact, more than likely, everybody was kin to everybody because that's the way it is in villages still today in the land of Israel. All right, so from, the, from Nazareth, we will also go, after seeing the church of the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, then we're also going, and the archaeological excavation, first century artifacts and that sort of thing. Then we're going to look across the valley from this ridge, the same ridge that the people of Nazareth wanted to push Jesus off after his sermon in Luke chapter 4. You with me? All right. This is a Jesus trip. This is life of Jesus. So 
there are lots of things that you can do in Israel, but we're going to be focusing on Jesus and his life and ministry. By the way, when we moved to Israel in 1982, I moved there to learn Hebrew really well and figured, okay, well, I'll learn a little bit about the land of Israel because that's where the Old Testament happened. I'd kind of almost like forgotten because I'd only been saved about five years. The whole life and ministry of Jesus takes place right here. Half of the book of Acts takes place right here. The entire New Testament is written with a mindset, whether it's John or it's Peter, it's James, it's Paul, a mindset developed here. Okay, So you get here, you get the whole guacamole. Uh, sorry for speaking the other holy language. <laughs> All right. So this is the Nazareth Ridge. This is about a thousand foot drop to the um, valley floor below. So now we're back in the, in the Jezreel Valley. And I'm going to click and drag so you get perspective. So we're there at the Nazareth Ridge. Everybody, you, you haven't lost your place, right? We're in the north of Israel. We're in Galilee, okay? And so now we're looking across at the hill of Moray or Mount Moray. This is uh, Shunem here where, uh, where uh, Elijah raised the woman's son from the dead. Over here is uh, a, a, an Arabic village whose name is Nin, which preserves the ancient Hebrew Nain or Nain, where Jesus raised a woman's only son from the dead. Then back here on the backside is a place called Ain Dor or Endor, we say the witch at, okay, and where Sam, uh, Samuel's uh, departed spirit was raised to speak to King Saul. Really weird story in the Bible, but this is the place where people come back from the dead, the hill of Moray, right here. All right, looking across the valley, we're able to see the city of Jezreel, uh, where... Um, the uh, eunuchs threw Jezebel out of the window and she died. Remember Ahab and Jezebel that brought all the idolatry into the northern kingdom in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. All right, so there's Jezreel. Right here is where Gideon gathered his forces together to fight against the Midianites and Amalekites and Ishmaelites who were all gathered around the hill of Moray with a valley between them. Mount Gilboa right here is where Saul gathered his forces, King Saul, together to fight against the Philistines who were also gathered at the hill of Moray. Almost like an instant replay only generations later. It took me 35 or 40 years to put those dots together. Okay, you were already there. Don't make fun of me or take my name in vain. Um, but it just takes a while for me. Um, so put those two together. Gideon fought here against his enemy. Saul fought here against his enemy. Gideon won because he obeyed God. Saul lost because he was running from and disobeying God. That's still working today, right? Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap, Paul says in the book of Galatians. So same God, same principles at work. Obedience brings the blessing of God. Moral of the story is you, we should... Obey, right. But you're in the middle of the train track with the blessing coming right at you. Gotta love that. Okay, it's still early, Pastor. <laughs> yeah, all right. We're going to get that coffee break in real soon. Maybe we'll move that up to, uh, I don't know, maybe another 10 minutes. <laughs> all right, we look across at Jezreel, and right behind Jezreel and right behind the spring of Gideon is another mountain chain called Mount Gilboa. Not Balboa, that would be in the Rocky movies. Um, pause for laughter, there is none, move on. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to wake up too. Just a different form of caffeine. Mount Gilboa. The Bible says in 1 Samuel at the end that uh, the archers found Saul. And he and his sons were retreating up out of the valley floor where the Philistines had chariots and they had tactical superiority up into the mountains where the chariots could not navigate and maybe they could get away. Didn't work out so well. So 
Saul ends up dying. All of his sons end up dying. Jonathan, the crown prince uh, who's supposed to take Saul's place, he dies as well. Everybody's dead on Mount Gilboa. And so then uh, at the beginning of the next chapter, you hear David lamenting the death of Saul and his beloved friend Jonathan, right? And he says, may no rain or no dew fall on you, Mount Gilboa, um, because the, uh, how the mighty have fallen, the, 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 beauty, the beauty of Israel slain on your mountaintops. And so as Israel has reforested Mount Gilboa, and you can see how green, how lush it is. You can see the forests here. This is not forested. Part of Mount Gilboa has been left unforested in memory of that lament that David sang to his friend John, about his friend Jonathan and King Saul that he had once uh, served. So that's enough of that, I guess. Uh, and, and now we're going to go on because you're tired. It's time to get you to your second place where you will sleep, which is we're going to ease over to, ah, I thought I would mention before we left uh, Nazareth. We are also going to visit Sephoris and uh, Cana. Uh, sorry, uh, wrong identification. Uh, Cana, where he performed his first miracle, turning the water into wine, or if you're AG and observant, the wine into water. Um, I'm going to keep on moving on, guys. You just got to hang with me. All right, so following these roads right here, the blue road is the Old Testament road. The red road is the Roman road. But the modern roads run in the same place. Can you do the math on that real quick? Why would the modern roads run in the same place that the ancient roads ran in? They're already there, A. And human beings are always looking for the easiest and quickest way to get from point A to point B. Do we still do that today? Oh, yeah. And so... Uh, when you're riding along one of these highways in Israel, they'll have light posts and they'll have guardrails and, you know, modern uh, four, five, six lane highways, uh, just like we do. It's not a third world country, it's a first world country. So you'll be riding along a modern road. You can pretty much be assured because of this, you know, easiest and quickest way of getting from point A to point B, that you're somewhere right around the ancient road. So we go down these, the, the ancient road that splits the, va the, the two mountains, uh, the Turan Ridge and uh, the Nazareth Ridge, and we ease over to the area of the Sea of Galilee. More than likely, we'll go, this is the city of Tiberias, uh, the capital in Jesus, the district capital in Jesus' day. And then we're going to go down the western side around the southern tip and over to where we're going to be spending the night at Kibbutz Ein Gev. Gonna absolutely love it. Spending the, the nights on the shore of the Sea of Galilee at a kibbutz. That, that's a collective living arrangement where people work together and play together and study together and stuff like that. We call them communes, but there's not a whole lot of drugs going on and a whole lot of other stuff, right? It's, these are there for mutual protection and education of children and that sort of thing. Families living together in family units, but living collectively together. So Kibbutz Ein Gev, they have a holiday village and that's where we'll be staying. There is a beach and there is sand there, but like I said, the normal sand is only on the western shore, on the Mediterranean. So this is trucked in for you. It's just right there waiting right now. And um, just beautiful accommodations, good food, lots of fun. And spending the night, you know, when you come back from a hard day of study and putting up with me and Pastor Weaver, whoever, uh, then you get to come back, have dinner, walk out on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, look for ancient anchors made of uh, rock. The, I guess the fishermen had their kids bore holes in to keep them busy and out of trouble. Uh, just a wonderful place. And you're staying right at the foot of the, um, the Golan Heights. You can see this ridge right along here, yes? Okay, that's the Golan Heights falling down into the Jordan Valley. So you have the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River coming into the Sea of Galilee here and then leaving right here to go down to the Dead Sea. So you're right in the middle of everything here. On the Sea of Galilee, like I said, we'll be taking a look at Tiberias, 
the regional capital, you're going to be visiting the home of Mary Magdalene, the synagogue that she attended from a child up into adulthood has been discovered. One of the only seven first century synagogues that have been discovered in the entire land of Israel and we're going to be staying right across the Sea of Galilee from it. There we'll also uh, see fish ponds where uh, fish was pickled, was salted, uh, and then exported. So Magdala. We'll also be visiting the home of Jesus, kind of home away from home, sort of like uh, New Hope and Urbandale is to Lacey and me anymore. Um, and uh, we'll be uh, visiting Jesus' base of operations for his three, three and a half year ministry, the city of Capernaum. We'll see probably what is the oldest church in the world. Uh, goes back to the first century. Uh, plaster on the walls found with inscriptions or you know, carvings inscribed with uh, mentions of Peter and Jesus, etc. Uh, first century fish hooks and, and oil lamps and that sort of thing. Uh, with a modern church built over top of it, but it's built on stilts so you can still see the ancient one. How cool is that? You come to church, 21st century, this one's dialed back 21 centuries. First century reality, Jewish Christian reality in the land of Israel, indigenous Jesus movement, first century. The synagogue where Jesus cast the demon out of the man. Um, uh, first miracle recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's happening right here at Capernaum and the like. Half of Jesus' disciples came from the city of Bethsaida. So we're going to be overlooking the city of Bethsaida as well. Yet another one, Jesus mentions, he says in Matthew 11 and Luke 10, parallel passages, Woe to you, Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin. So we're going to be mentioning uh, or visiting a place that is, um, uh, was a place where Jesus performed many mighty miracles according to him. From there, we'll also go up to go around the Sea of Galilee to a city called Gadara or Gergesa. All right, this is where Jesus cast the demons out of the man named fill in the blank. Goes into the pigs, goes down the slope, and drowns in the Sea of Galilee. What was the guy's name? Legion. Okay, so. This is Gentile territory in Jesus' day. It's the reason for the pigs, the reason why the guy's living among the tombs. It's the reason why you have somebody demon-possessed and he calls the, himself by a Roman name, Legion. Legion, Legio. Yeah? And so uh, that's, that's the Sea of Galilee. We're also going to go to the north. And we'll follow the Upper Jordan Valley. Why is it called the Upper Jordan Valley? because it has the Upper Jordan River in it, right, uh, right here. You can see the discoloration where the water flows into the Sea of Galilee. I love satellite imagery. Thank God for declassified military satellite data. It made this, this part of the project possible. Okay, so you can see the channel that the Jordan River has cut into the ground, right? All right. And we're headed in the direction of the northern border of Israel, which runs approximately here. Lebanon to the north, Syria to the northeast. And we go straight up the Jordan Valley and more or less follow this ancient road. And we come to a couple of places that we're going to stop and visit for a considerable amount of time. One of them is ancient Dan. And that sort of in the Bible is used as the furthest north major city marking kind of the northern border of Israel um, and this is an, uh, largely an Old Testament site. All kinds of really fascinating stuff that you're going to see there and be able to connect with specific Bible passages. But then we're going to go up the road. It's just a five minute uh, journey to, to the next town that we're going to visit. And this is the city of Caesarea Philippi. It's the Caesarea of Philip. 
So Philip is the leader here. He's the, uh, one of the three surviving sons of Herod the Great. And he builds a great polis, you know, like Indianapolis or Minneapolis, uh, a, a great Greek city here. Jesus doesn't visit the city itself, but he comes near it. And in Matthew 16, he asks a question of his disciples. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And then that, there's this discussion that follows about the identity of Jesus. Is he John the Baptist raised from the dead? Is he one of the other prophets who've come back from the dead? Um, and then Peter says, because Jesus asked him directly, who do you say that the Son of Man is? I guess in a way we could ask, I could ask the same thing. Who do you say that he is? Is he just a good man? Was he just a good role model? Was he, an, was he maybe a, a, an important prophet? That, that's what's taught in Islam. That's what's taught in the Quran. That Isa is, is, is just a great prophet. Like Moses or like Muhammad. But, but that's about it. But who do you say that he is? About 40 years ago I made a decision. And I call him Master. And Savior. Lord. Coming King. But who do you say that I am? And Peter says, right here, you'll stand on the very ground, the area where this discussion takes place. We say that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The fulfillment of all of this prophetic Jewish expectation about God coming and visiting his people and bringing deliverance. That's who we say you are. And, and beyond that, you're not just the Messiah, the Christ. You are the son of the living God. So we'll be discussing that, putting that in its full context. After that, of course, you, you know, you can't just study all the time. We're going to go to a neat uh, village that is inhabited entirely by a population of uh, people who are Arab in descent, but their religion is Druze, D-R-U-Z-E, Druze. If you've not been to Israel, you've probably never heard of these people. Thank God for Google, right? So you can figure that out before we even go. But these guys, one of the reasons why we stop here, it's not to be converted to, to Druze-ism. It's to have some of the most amazing and original food that you'll ever put in your mouth. Druze lunch that day. And then we move on after we have had our nourishment to the top of an extinct volcano where there's the best coffee shop in all of Israel. See, we're, we, we, we're keeping you, you, your best interest in, in mind. But it's a great lookout point to look across the Golan Heights, extinct volcanoes everywhere. Look across the Golan Heights. Uh, let me get uh, a little bit of height here on the Golan Heights. And we're going to be able to survey not only Mount Hermon that is snow-capped year-round because um, it goes up to 9,200 feet above sea level. Uh, it's the highest point in Israel altitudinally. And at its base lies a Roman road that is called the... I'm going to give you a hint. You're looking 40 miles away at the capital of Syria. It's at the very edge of the data that we bought. And it's called Damascus or in Hebrew Damasic. Okay, so this road would be the road to, yes. You see how easy this is? When you've got it right in front of you, the learning is so quick and so easy. There's so little that you really have to explain because it's right there in front of you. Not in black and white, right there in front of you in HD and 3D. It's awesome. It's just you, you point and you refer to a Bible passage. And then the aha moments are, oh, okay, that's what the Bible was talking about when it says whatever it says. We're going to do this Paul and the road to Damascus in session three this morning. Is that fair enough? That sound good? Okay. So we'll take care of that. And uh, now you've got the bigger picture that you can click and drag what you're seeing into that discussion. We'll review. That's always good. In America, review is boring. In the Bible, review is important because it's the way you learn. Not exactly sure how to get those two together, but we're working on it. I've only been doing this for like 30 years. <laughs> Still working on it. So continue to click and drag. This is the only way you're going to get to Damascus, guys. This is a different country. All right? 
So you get to Damascus right here. And in the Bible, there's a guy named Ananias. He shows up in Acts 9. God speaks to him. He says, I want you to go and deal with this guy named Saul. Okay? He, um, he, is, he is in the city of Damascus and he is waiting for you. He's staying with another guy on the street called... There you go. I, I guess you see it, right? The street called... Straight. Yeah. But you know, if you're going to go with the liberal approach, the, I, I, I don't really believe it. I don't believe it until I see it, whatever. Yeah, that's just all make-believe. Yes, right. Tell somebody living in Damascus that that's just all make-believe. And they're going to go, no, it's Main Street. Everybody knows this. What's wrong with you? I don't know. Maybe I've lived in the West too long. All right. So now we, sorry for the stomach issues. Now we're going to fly from the city of Damascus, okay, past the Mount Hermon area and Caesarea Philippi and uh, Dan that we were, we were just introduced to. I'm going to kind of speed it up just a little bit. And we're going to ease on into Golan Heights, which is called Golan and sometimes in the Bible, Bashan, B-A-S-H-A-N. You can see the upper Jordan Valley. You can see Upper Galilee and Lower Galilee where Jesus lived and ministered. We're still, still in the Golan Heights. You can still see these volcanic cones. You see the Sea of Galilee, 13 miles long, 7 miles wide at its longest and widest points. Here from a different perspective you see Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin and Magdala and Gergesa, and where we're going to be staying, Ein Gev, Kibbutz Ein Gev, which has one of the, I'm going to stop real quick, you've heard the word Decapolis before, right? Deca means like decade and decimal point and stuff. Deca in Latin means, yes, 10, and polis, we already talked about it, means in Greek, Cities, so 10 cities. So there's a loose federation of 10 cities around here that are joined together. They don't have a leader from Rome. They appoint their own. They're totally free. They're like an autonomous zone. So these guys are just living fat and happy. Don't have a lot of taxes. They don't have a, the heavy boot of Rome on their neck. They're mostly Gentile, so they can let it all hang out and do what they want to do. Man, everybody's just happy right here in the Decapolis. Um, and so there's a Decapolis city right here. It's called Susita, or in Latin, Hippus. It means the little horse. Like Hippopotamus means river horse. So Hippus. Right above you, this is where you're staying for a week-ish. Ein Gev. Right above us, in your backyard, is going to be one of the ten great Decapolis cities. This, I believe, we don't have the opportunity to share this on uh, this trip to New Hope, but I've written on it in a couple of different articles. I think that this is Jesus' visual aid or point of reference when he's back up here on the Mount of Beatitudes and he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. Right straight across the Sea of Galilee, you can see Hippus. In fact, you can see Hippus from any point around the sea. And by the way, it's the only city that sits on a hill in the first century. So I think that this is Jesus' point of reference. You have the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill can't be hidden. So don't light your light and then put it under a basket. But let your light so shine that your Father, that, that people see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Anyway, that's just kind of that show and tell sort of stuff that we do when we're in the land of Israel. But we're going to continue to go to the south. Uh, we're going to sort of, in a sense, follow Jesus' last trip to Jerusalem down the Jordan Valley where he also goes through this area here is called Gilead in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's, um, uh, uh, it's part of the Decapolis. He goes through an area to the south of that called Perea. You see the, um, the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River going down and dumping into the Dead Sea. Are you able to see that? All right, so I'm going to speed up just a little bit. Okay, so now we're in Perea, and you stop this and go to the right, 
and again you're in the area of Samaria. We'll spend some time in Samaria. Um, but we saw it from the coast. That's over here at Tel Aviv and, and at Netanya and on the way to Mount Carmel. Now we're seeing Samaria. It's north of Judea, but south of Galilee, kind of the Oreo cookie, the white and the cookie sandwiched in between. Jewish Judea, Jewish Galilee, and Samar Samaritan Samaria. That's got to make sense, right? And I'm, I don't, won't make any, on this trip, I'll make no jokes about men of some area or women of some area. That won't happen, so you're safe. <laughs> okay, you see the channel of the Jordan River. That's coming out of the Sea of Galilee and now dumping into the Dead Sea. I've got eight minutes. Eight minutes? Ish. All right. Here you see Bethany, and that is, stop, this is the Jordan River. So this is the Bethany beyond the Jordan that is spoken of in the Gospel of John chapter 1, where he says, I think it's around verse 28, all these things happened in Bethany beyond the Jordan. What things? John the Baptist ministry, his preaching that you hear about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You brood of vipers, etc., etc. Um, uh, this is also where John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. So we're, we're all over this place. Um, this is the place where the Spirit of the Lord, after descending upon Jesus in the form of a dove, then leads him into the wilderness, this Judean wilderness, to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights as he's fasting by the adversary, by the devil. Okay? By the way, Bethany beyond the Jordan is at a ford, a, 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 a shallow spot in the Jordan River. And that connects directly to the ancient city. Do you see this oasis here? Jericho. Both Old Testament and New Testament Jericho. And you can also see the road running up from Jericho. Follow the Roman road. Keep following the Roman road. Keep on. Wait for it. Wait for it. Keep following it. You come to the city of Jerusalem. So this is the Jerusalem-Jericho road. Jesus traveled it. King David traveled it. Jehoshaphat traveled it. Everybody traveled it. It's the way you get east-west. And this is the story of the Good Samaritan, which I will be preaching on Sunday evening, tomorrow from 5 to 6. It's almost like the, uh, the, the reboot, 2.0 upgrade, restart, whatever, of Sunday night church at New Hope. Or so I understand. Is it true? Yeah. So hasn't happened for a while, but it is going to happen tomorrow night. After that, it's up to you guys. I'm going to leave it with you. All right. While we're here, see th th this is Jericho right in the lower right of the screen. You can see eight miles to the area of Qumran. The reason Qumran is important, not mentioned in the Old Testament by name, not mentioned in the New Testament. Well, it may be. Old Testament, there's a place called the City of Salt. Remember, Dead Sea, salty water, 34% mineral saline. You can almost walk on water. Almost get your miracle on right there. So I think it may be referred to this spot called Qumran because there are Old Testament remains there. Some have been found. This may be the Old Testament city of salt. Not referred to in the New Testament either, but the reason why this place, Qumran, is important to us today is because of the discovery. I'm stalling for time. There you go, I heard it. The Dead Sea Scrolls. Fragments of more than 900 manuscripts that come to us from the time of the New Testament and before the New Testament, dialing all the way back two centuries before the New Testament. Suppose that might have any relevance for our study of the New Testament? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So we make a stop at Qumran. We will also at least go by 
the city of, I was doing aerial photography, uh, labeling it just the other day, video, Ain Getty. It's a spring, you can see the greenery around it. It, it runs year round. And this is one of the places where David hid from King Saul in his outlaw days. Yeah. This is what David is talking about, this outlaw period. Only goodness and mercy, only God's covenant loyalty and his favor will follow me. Or the word in Hebrew is chase me down. And that's what he was being, was being done to him in his, in his outlaw phase. He was being chased, harried, harassed all over the country. Ends up having to take refuge with the, the arch enemies of Israel, the Philistines, for a period of time. But he's incorporating that language from being chased in these wilderness, this desolate area here that he could hide from King Saul in because there's nobody there to tell on him. All kinds of places to hide. And remember Saul goes into a cave and David sneaks in and cuts the hem of his garment off. Remember this story? Okay, that's happening in the Judean wilderness. Saul's not from there. He has no idea where he is or you know, where the hiding places are, where the way, routes of escape. But David does because he is from the tribe of Judah. So ultimately, we end up at this mountaintop fortress called, um, help me folks, Masada. All right? You see the Roman road, the Old Testament road. That's where the modern road runs. But now there's a turnoff. And we will park right around here and stop. And this is... Masada. It's the mountaintop fortress built by King Herod the Great, the guy who killed the babies in Bethlehem trying to kill Jesus. Matthew chapter 2, Christmas. You remember all this? Okay. That's this, it's sort of a mesa. These uh, erosion areas here have left the, the tougher rock standing so that it's over a thousand feet above the valley floor down here. This is also where the um, Romans concluded the conquest of Judea in AD 73. The temple had been destroyed in AD 70. Three years later, there are still pockets of Jewish resistance and this is one of them. And so there are zealots, revolutionaries, uh, who had rebelled against Rome and they were holed up right here at Masada. Took a period of months for them to build a siege ramp that you can still see from outer space right here. Uh, and Herod's palace here where they were just having a wonderful time until the Romans showed up. And this is where it all ended with the Roman uh, conquest of Masada. Dead Sea goes all the way down to here. You know there's a passage in the book of Ezekiel chapter 47 that says that the Dead Sea waters are going to become fresh in the end time, in the messianic age. That's going to be a cool event. I'm looking forward to that. So no longer do you have to just float in the Dead Sea like you guys will do without a flotation device because you don't need it. But we'll be able to swim and splash and have fun in the Dead Sea. All right, my time is up here, but I did want to show you. We're going to get up a little bit. I did want to show you the end of the country. The further south you get, the more arid Israel gets for just lack of rain, lack of Mediterranean coastline to bring rain in. And I wanted to show you a little bit of the wildernesses, the deserts of Sinai. This is outside of biblical Israel. Biblical Israel ends right here at Beersheba. This is where Abraham lived. Isaac lived, Jacob left from here to go find his wife, came back to here. Abraham leaves from Beersheba to go to Jerusalem, the area of Mount Moriah, to sacrifice Isaac. This is a really cool spot too. But I wanted you to be able to see from Beersheba all the way to where you were a minute ago. Got to go a little higher too. Ah, that's a good shot, right? No? Okay, I'll keep trying. Okay, Beersheba is right below you. Right here. And the mountaintop that's capped in snow was called Mount 
Hermon. Okay. Right below Mount Hermon was the Old Testament city. Three letters. Starts with a D. Dan. Okay. When the Bible says, and it says it all over the place in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, from Dan to Beersheba, what does the Bible mean by that? From the far extremities in the north of Israel all the way to the far extremities of the south for Israel. So it's basically saying that, and David numbered the people from Dan to Beersheba, meaning the whole country. Or, and all of Israel knew that Samuel had been confirmed as a prophet from Dan even unto Beersheba. It means the whole country knew that Samuel was a prophet raised up by God. Okay, now it's time for you to raise up and go on your what? break.